Well, good morning, evening, and afternoon to y'all out there. It's so awesome to see. I love seeing where you guys are from. Portugal, Oklahoma, Turkey, Pennsylvania, Romania, and uh, Nuevo Mexico. Is that what Santa Fe? I've heard of that. You know, hey, we got somebody from Muncie, Muncie, Indiana. I was born in Kendallville, so uh, wow, we're just one of my friends in college was from Muncie, Indiana, Scotch Plains, New Jersey. I didn't know there was a place there. You guys drink a lot of scotch there on that plane, and we got Spain, we've got uh, where are we, Fort Israel, Fort Wayne, Israel, Boulder, Colorado. Laos and the Mekong. Wow. Oh, Trinidad, Hungary, India, Switzerland, Poland, Utah. Dude. Check this out. Yeah. Boulder, Colorado, there's a tea house. And I'm sure whoever signed in, Tim from Boulder, there's that famous like Kazakhstani tea house or whatever in Boulder. And I went there last winter and they had this stuff called golden milk, this drink. And I had it and I was like, God, that's good. And the bartender was really cool, and I still, I'm still carrying it around. He wrote the recipe <laughs> down on a there. little piece of paper, and I still have it in my journal because I'm going to make it at some point, probably when winter comes back. We should uh, – Johannesburg, I love your city. I've been there. I've been to the Kruger National Park, shot the animals up there with my camera, not with a gun. That was phenomenal. Went to Cape Town, traveled all around South Africa. It's an incredible place. Well, listen, I guess we should officially get this started here. I got to do my little intro. I'm Mark Silver. I'm an author and a photographer in Carmel, California. And I'm so glad to have you guys with us and to let you know that our episode today is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo Lab. We were just talking about prints. <laughs> guess what? The newest thing in the world is getting your stuff printed, whether it's on a wall or framed on your wall. It could be a coffee cup, could be a book, it could be a zine, it could be in any particular form, but make sure you're making prints. Bay Photo Lab will help you guys out. They are phenomenal. They'll also give you a 25% discount for your first order. I'm going to do something really cool with them. They're going to scan. They have the Heidelberg uh, drum scanner, which is pretty much the you know the, the top of the line and we're going to do some drum scans of some of my photos from the 60s stay tuned for that but you know what go after the show make sure you go there and order some prints because you guys need to make prints of your stuff and our guest today is none other than the famous the one and only the amazing dan milner a documentary photographer and creative evangelist for blurb and your friend and mine here he is folks dan milner welcome back to the That's show Dan. Me. my specialty these days really is email and conference calls those are the two things that i'm better at those than anything good. else so well, now you're getting photography <laughs> is photography's fallen down a little bit and email and conference calls has gone dramatically up it's actually been uh since covid hit uh, and that's the, the gist of today's podcast is literally about adaptation to something like, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in. And when COVID hit, I thought my life at Blurb would get exponentially slower. I'm used to working from home. I've done it since the early 90s. So it was nothing new for me to be at home. I love isolation. I love being by myself. I can go weeks and not talk to anyone. My wife, on the other hand, not so much. But what happened was the polar opposite happened. Blurb became more uh, sort of frenetic and, and in, for good reason, because everyone was scrambling. Suddenly yeah. everyone's working from home, major disruptions in print spaces and shipping spaces. I mean, we're still, the postal service here is having some issues right now. I've been sending out AG23 boxes all over the world and I've been tracking them. And it's pretty funny to see the tracking where, you know, some packages arrive early and then others like, it could be weeks later, regardless of what service you've chosen. Uh, it's still it's still working, and I'm not faulting anyone. I mean, this is obviously a scenario part, that's unlike part of the anything scene. we've seen. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of ex when COVID hit, I just said to my wife, we have to we have to redefine the word patience because there's that's nothing so we true. can do. We just so we just true. have to be patient. And I think this, and secondarily, I think, and this is a port, an important point for today's talk, which is. 
we have to think collectively as a whole. So as a photographer, I cannot think the same way that I did before, because <clears throat> if I'm putting myself at risk to make photographs or I'm putting you at risk to make photographs, then that's not a good thing. Yeah. So I, I simply can't work. And there's a big difference, I think, between people who are professional news gatherers, you know, professional photographer, photojournalists in particular, who are on assignment documenting whether it's the virus or the civil unrest or whatever it is. And that's how they make their, their livelihood. That's one thing. And they're masked up and they're doing whatever they can to stay protected. I think other folks who are going out to like, you know, make social images or whatever, I think that's where you really have to take a step back and say, am I thinking about myself or am I thinking about society in general? And I, I think that's really the case of what the decision I made was I really have no good reason to be out there. Um, but if I do go out, I have to work differently than I did before. And that's the gist of today's entire talk is about how can I do something different from what I've done for the past, God knows how long, almost 30 years, I guess. Yeah. Does that make well, sense? Let's dive in. So yeah, our adapting our photography in these uncertain times is the theme. Yeah. So Dan, carry yeah. away. You guys, by the way, you're going to have questions, I know. So make sure you're firing those questions in. We will pick them up a little later. Jared will read them, but put them in there in the chat so we can see what you guys are interested in. And Dan, okay. over to you, my friend, amigo. All I right, love so your, by the way, I love your set. You've got Andy over your shoulder there. You've got so many phenomenal photographers and books. And this we could do yeah. a whole show on just what I'm looking at right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate. I've known, I've been around photography a long time, and my wife and I have collected prints, and I've also spent my whole life around professional photographers. So I've been able to, to get prints. I was telling you earlier, I have, um, and I collect paintings as well. So I have in front of me, which you can't see, Philip Vigil, who's a, a young painter here in New Mexico, who is just phenomenal. I think I have one, two, three, at least three of his pieces, maybe more. Lawrence Fodor, another painter in New Mexico. Um, who I love. He's one of the most talented, creative people I've ever been around. When I'm around him, it sort of makes me nervous in some ways because he's so far beyond me. But I've also got, you know, the Michael Greco, Jose Coyasoys. That's a Greg Gorman of uh, Andy Warhol. I've got Jeff Frost. Um, and uh, Amy's stuff. got a few of my wife and Gerd Ludwig, the German photographer for the Geographic. So, yeah, we've got a good collection. But let me explain something to you before we go further. Please. Let me explain how I would define who I am as a photographer, right? And this is important because I can't be this person right now. So historically, I always loved long form, people based, reality based documentary photography projects, meaning I go find a story that I want to do a topic it could be a place could be a people or could be a specific angle. Uh, I've done stories on the border. I've done stories on a uh, big wave surfing on the on the North Shore of Oahu. I've done stories on religion in Sicily, that kind of thing. But everything I do is people based. I don't shoot landscapes. I don't shoot product. I don't stage images unless I am doing a portrait specifically. So most of the time, my work revolves re requires a tremendous amount of time and a tremendous amount of of access because I'm not jumping out on the street in front of people who don't know me, but snapping an image and then going away and not having any dialogue or connection yeah. to those people. That's just a different style. So what I like to do is find a community and, and start talking first and then gain access, gain permission, gain trust, and then go back over and over and over again to build a body of work. And that is a very laborious, slow, uh, difficult way to work. You often come back with nothing. It may take you three or four trips before you can even start to make photographs, et cetera. So, for example, this is from my New Mexico field guide. But, you know, this is a, a, a portrait I made um, at a casino up in Española. And it may look like that's just a, a standard portrait. But what went into getting this picture was weeks of time. And I didn't know I was getting this picture. I didn't know who this person was, but I found myself in a situation where it was incredibly difficult to shoot. And I realized immediately that I probably should not be where I was. And she came across through the crowd to me and said, basically, I know what you're thinking, but I just want you to know it's okay to be here and that nothing's going to happen to you and you're fine. And if you want to make pictures, you can make pictures. And so that, you know, I'd been working on this project for, for, for a few weeks before that happened. Um, same with these photographs here. 
you know, these were all done uh, in very short proximity to one another. But it took me weeks of hanging out with these people for a long, long time to be able to get permission. Started with a small cluster of people. They introduced me to a few more, a few more. Then I started getting into the houses. Then I started to meet the grandparents, the parents, the kids, um, et cetera. That's the kind of work I love to do. Yeah. It's, um, again, very low percentage success rate, very labor intensive, time intensive, access intensive. And there's a reason why that work is dropping off dramatically in photography is that people don't want to spend that time. So now we find ourselves in COVID and I simply can't do it safely. And I, and I don't really have, if, if everybody was masked up and distanced, I couldn't do the work that I want to do. So I've just had to say, okay, I'm going to try something else. I have to adapt. And I came up with like five ways I'm going to do this. And, um, and hopefully these are interesting to more people than just me. That sound I'm good? interested, Dan. I just want you to know you have one person. You better for sure. be. You, you have to say that. You're the host. Okay. So number one, I study. So and I and I've, I've, I've there's been some tough love with this point over the past you know six months of working with you, Mark. Not tough love towards you, Mark, but because I know that you're on the same page. But tough love um, for the general public, which is yes. if you're gonna do documentary work you have to do your research, right? Okay. And there's a million reasons not to do it. There's a million excuses we all have, but you have to, if you're gonna do good work that adds to the conversation and what better time to do study and to do research than being in, in lockdown or quarantine. Yep. Um, I, I, I discovered a new project idea yesterday while I was riding my bike, which is where I come up with a lot of my ideas. And when I'm suffering physically and mentally suffering on the bike, for some reason I have this moments of clarity where I think about projects. And the project is a very weird thing that I'm going to talk about in a minute. I'm not going to give you the exact project, but I'm going to tell you why it's different from what I do before. And I realized immediately the amount of research I have to do for this. And the first thing I found was that there is a book available out there. It's a $60 book that's like a weird, hard to find book, but it's, it is essential reading for me to move forward with this project. I simply would not bother moving forward if I don't read this book. Because if I move forward without reading it, then I'm not crediting everybody who's already done this project before. And this is a project that touches on a subject that impacted every single human being on the planet. It just so happens to be connected very much to the state of New Mexico. And for those of you who know the history of New Mexico, I'm sure you can piece it together pretty quickly. But I'm going to do a different take on it. And so I realized, okay, I'm excited to make pictures. I have very little time because I work blurb. My blurb job is pretty hectic, but I can study and I can research this book with them, with maps and with every piece of content. You know, the Santa Fe Public Library has a, an entire room dedicated to New Mexico literature. So there's a lot of stuff that I can do to come up with. And the fun part of the research side is that it's fun because learning about this stuff, there's not a single person on this call I would guess that has the level of knowledge required about this subject to do this story. Unless there's, you know, maybe, maybe there's a chance if someone lives in Los Alamos, they might have this kind of knowledge, but yeah. very, very unlikely. So that's number one. Um, number two, let me, let me, let me hold this up, Jared. And I've held this up before. There's my recipe for golden milk, yes, that I've been carrying around. I need around you to send forever. that to me, Dan. Take a picture of it afterwards and send it over. Mark, you would you would flip if you had this. It's good. Here's it. my little cheapy fountain pen. Okay, cool. Um, and, you know, this is a journal, right? This is the journal that I've been keeping for my whole life, right? I've been doing this since heavily since 93, but I write in this thing every day. But there are levels of craziness when it comes to journaling. And I saw a documentary film on Amazon Prime a couple of days ago that I think everyone should watch. Even if you don't know anything about rock climbing or don't like rock climbing or are really not interested in rock climbing, there is a, 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 a documentary film called Dirtbag. Oh, and Dirt I've Bag seen is, it. <laughs> yeah, Dirtbag yeah. is about Fred Becky. Fred is and such Fred a wild Be dude. Yeah. <laughs> he Fred is Becky off the chart. Up. He, he, he passed away, uh, at, I think, mid-90s or 96, 97 years old. He passed away in 2017, I want to say. Yeah. And Fred Becky put up more first routes, first ascents in North America uh, than anyone in history by a long shot. Hundreds while keeping a hundreds. notebook, while he took notes on the climb. That's, that's, that's the most insane right. thing. 
That's right. So Fred Becky is known as this just maniacal driven <laughs> climber. He climbed until his mid nineties, and there's and, and it's in the film. They show him at ninety three, yeah. dragging himself up. You know, he's on a top rope and people are like pulling him, but he's like dragging himself up at 93. And you're like, I've never seen that kind of drive it's, ever it's from anybody. And so, but what got me about Fred Becky was not, he only, he has like eight or 10 published books about climbing. And then there's a book about Fred Becky called like his hundred top climbs, which you can find. Yeah. And it's a beautiful like picture book. But one of the things that jumped out at me was one of the younger guys that would climb with him said, Fred will stop in the middle of a pitch it's and ridiculous. you look down like what's happening and he has his pencil and his notepad and he's sketching out the route and also taking notes and he was this wildly meticulous note taker that spent tons and tons and tons of time in the library and his girlfriend said historically he's one of the most well-read people they'd ever seen and what watching this documentary made me realize was that i had sort of been leaping this chapter of journaling out which was what i would call simple journaling which is Fred would have pictures of like, here's the mountain I climbed in 1950. Yeah. Here's the title. This is the route we took. And my journal has never been really like what I'm doing. It's been more of a stream of consciousness kind of thing. And I, and in the back of my head, I had some sort of hang up about simple journaling. Like here's a picture of what I did that day. And this is what I did that day. But all of a sudden during the pandemic and realizing that I can't spend all this time in the field. And if I did go in the field, why not document all the small things that I'm doing? Because it's fun. Maybe my brothers, you know, kids and my nieces and nephews at some point in time will go back through these books like people are doing with Fred Becky's journals now and say, wow, this is a really interesting take on history. Yeah. So what I've really decided to do during the pandemic is to is to really double down on the daily journal. And I think that one of the really ways good. to do that for me, which is this which is this little Fuji Instax Mini 90. Oh, now yeah, I, have all of the, I, have, I have all the different sizes um, of the Instax Mini. And I have the bigger one as well that shoots the nice print. I'm, I'm out of film Fuji if anybody's listening to this. But um, I have tons of film for this little Mini 90. And I also just discovered that this thing does um, multiple exposures, which I have huh. no idea. I discovered it by accident last week, and I'm like, okay, that's an even cooler thing. But this is such a, a wonderful way of having instant, um, you know, instant ability to journal. And so, like, I slept up in my van on the mountainside last week and made a bunch of these, like, little, you know, Polaroids along the way. So I am definitely doubling down on the journal during the pandemic. I think I it's a really wonderful thing. And let me give you a tip, because I also get this question at least once a week is that oftentimes people have difficulty starting a journal and they'll write me and say, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm nervous. I don't, I don't know how to start this. And I think the number one cause of that issue is that people are writing with other people in mind exactly. instead of themselves. If you are writing for other people, you are not journaling. Yeah. And so what you have to do is forget about the rest of the world. And you go into your own head and it may not be comfortable in there at first. A lot of people, you know, the whole theory is not a theory, but the studies that have been done over the last decade where they take people, they isolate them in a room and, and they make them sit by themselves with no stimulation and then give them the chance of either getting out early if they suffer, if they get an electric shock or staying in a room with their own thoughts and a significant percentage and the people chose to be shocked so they, they could get out of the room ah. because they don't want to be in their own head. And so journaling is about your own head. There is no right and wrong. It is not for anyone else. And I think once you've made that decision, it will flow effortlessly because yeah. we all have, you know, we have puppy, puppy brain, as the yogis like to say. Our brains are like all over the place. And the journal, I think, is a really good way to quiet those, um, the noise in your head. The other thing, Dan, that that you know what what happens with journaling, and I made this little film that I want you guys as soon as we're done to watch it if you haven't about inspiration, and one of the things I said was, you know, inspiration is around us all the time. It's not something that's injected into you or that, that comes in a bottle of Coke. It's you. Inspire means to breathe in. That's the root derivation from Latin. What a journal allows you to do, it causes you to slow down and look at what's actually in front of you. And, you know, it dispels this idea that you have to go somewhere else to find an inspiring photograph. I happened to be, when I made this, 
taking photographs of the Golden Gate Bridge, which was really cool from the Marin headlands. But one of the things I challenged people with, I said, look, I could come to your town, wherever you are, and I would find inspiring photographs. You may look around and think, oh, this is just where I live. This is ho-hum. One person even left a comment that he's from Stockholm and there's nothing exciting in Stockholm. I don't believe that. I really don't believe that. I know that there's something there. I know there's inspiring stuff. So again, the journal is another way to focus in on what's happening right here and now. Right, Dano? Yeah. And point number three so here we're, we're back to the idea that we're under COVID. And yeah. uh, so, and you have op multiple options. I can't, I cannot do with the camera what I would have done before, but I also write as well. And writing to me from, in me, for me personally, and I know this might sound crazy coming from someone who spent his life as a photographer, writing to me is the high art. It is the high art. And the yeah. reason I believe that is because with a writer, we it, it, let's say that, you know, Mark, you're a little older than I am, but let's say that we're basically from the same environment, the same subculture. You and I have access to, let's say, basically the same vocabulary, right? We have, we, we have the same understanding yeah. of the English language, but you have the ability to put words in an order that's very, very different from me, which is different from Jared, which is different from everyone else. And writers to me, are, are a group that you can learn a tremendous amount from. And I think if your camera, it, it's like um, it's like varying levels during COVID. So my, normally my camera was up here. Now my camera ability has dropped down, but my writing ability has gone up. Yeah. And what I like to do is give myself targets. I give 5,000 words as a really interesting target for me historically, whereas I've decided to start taking some of the projects that I would have done with the camera and had a little bit of writing along the side and flip it around where maybe there'll be an eventual image associated with what I'm writing, but now I'm going to do 5,000 word essays without any visuals at all. And wow. this is a incredible challenge, but also it's incredibly fun. And that's one of the reasons why I read so much is because you just get so many ideas. I just, I just finished yeah. one Q84 by Murakami and you know, I'm reading this thing and I'm, you know, this is not something that I would ever attempt to write. I'm not that whole sort of surrealism uh, book is not something I've ever considered. But man, can you learn a lot from from reading something like that? So I have done um, a lot of writing and this I want to bring up someone and Jared, I think you have this ready queued up, but I want to share with everybody a, a creative, I will call him, who lives in Japan and his name is Craig Maud. There he and is. I don't I, I met Craig once, but I don't know him at all. But I'm sort of in awe of everything he does. So how I would describe him is a writer, a photographer, a publisher and a tech guy. And um, he, he gives lectures at tech tech events all around the world prior to COVID, et cetera. He's in the process of coming out with a new book that's being finalized as we speak. His newsletters, if you don't know about Craig Maud's newsletters, he's, he has multiple. Some are about long distance hiking in Japan, some are about photography. They are absolutely, one's called Roden, one's called Ridgeline. They are absolutely worth su subscribing to. Every time I have the, a moment to open one of his emails, I am, uh, it's hard for me to even look at it because they are typically so good and so well done and so well written. And the writing part is what, it was what jumps out at me even though the rest of what he does is fantastic, everything he does is so well written that it just is like this constant push for me to get better, to have a better understanding of what I'm doing. Not to mention he knows all the tech behind what he's doing. He probably builds all these sites by himself. You know, he's just one of those like mad scientist guys. Amazing. I'm very much worth everybody's time. And Mark, you and I were talking about this earlier, um, the newsletter, uh, significance yeah, and if you want to talk right. about that now we should we should mention that yeah you know so this is a this is a key point for you guys in terms of marketing yourself and one of the things we have to do as creatives is if you've got something you believe in you believe in your work you got to get it out to other people right well there's a lot of ways to do that and traditionally probably one of the oldest ways to do that is through a newsletter I mean, originally back in the day, we used to print these things. And remember those things you'd put on a piece of paper called a stamp and you'd have to take it to the post office. That's how we used to do it. Now we do it through, you know, e-newsletters. But it's your 
communication vehicle to your community. And it's, Dan and I were talking about, it's probably the single most important and strongest way that you can communicate with your community, aside from, of course, these YouTube lives. I mean, honestly, this is my favorite. It really is because it's real time. And, yeah. you know, we, we get to see and hear from you guys. This beats everything. But a second rung down would be a newsletter, right, Dan? Mark, I have a, I have a catchphrase for you for advancing your photography, which is Please. space age, the space age and the stone age. So you have the space age of YouTube live and you have the stone age of the email newsletter. There you and go. I think, it's perfect. Yeah. So email newsletters to me, I get this question at least once a week from someone somewhere that reaches out and says, look, Milner, I kind of feel like you do about social media, but how do I do this without being on social media? And the number one answer I give immediately is you better have an email newsletter because the engagement rate on an email newsletter is astoundingly high, far higher than social media. And more importantly, the email newsletter signifies people who are willing to uh, to uh, uh, engage with you financially, which is yeah. very different from social. So it's about an 80 percent higher rate of engagement financial with a newsletter compared to social. And the newsletter builds a real community. And I have seen example after example after example of this over the years. I was telling you earlier, I know someone here in town who has a remarkable email newsletter. I know someone up in BC that basically his entire career is centered around a newsletter. I know of a photographer who apparently has 400,000 subscribers in his new his email newsletter. Wow. That is a, that is a career. That is an industry around a newsletter. And to your friend's point, these social networks change, adapt, you know, algorithms change. They make it harder and harder. You have to spend more time. But an email newsletter is yours. It's it is yours. absolutely yours. You yeah. own it. It will not change unless you want it to change. And so I know it seems crazy, but I would if I had the choice between 500 email newsletter subscribers and 50,000 Instagrammers, I would take the newsletter. So true. So that's and, something uh, you guys should start if you want to get your work out. Start with your whatever size list you've got, which is your friends and family and whoever you've got in your address book, and start your own yeah. newsletter. Start small. Very important. If, if you Stop. don't mind me butting in here quick, uh, this is Jared, by the way, for those who aren't familiar with my voice. A really good recent example of why this is so important. Um, some of you may or may not be aware of this, but there was a, a couple days ago where Twitter had an issue where people that had blue check marks, um, their accounts were getting hacked and they were posting links to scammers. Oh, man. And in response, Twitter made it, uh, they made it so that blue check mark account, Twitter accounts, couldn't tweet out for huh. like a good chunk of time. So even if you think like, oh, well, you know, I can build up a good Twitter audience or a good Facebook audience, that can be taken away from you in one second. So that's just another point of, you know, when you have your email list, you have your email list. But when you have Twitter, you have it as long as Twitter lets you have it. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw that in there that even there if you, you think, oh, I could do it, it can still be taken away from you. And, and to here's the other component. And someone named Jared, I think it's a different Jared, uh, asked a question about, you know, do you his his basically was email newsletter or versus personal website and blog. And my response was you do you do all of it. Because yeah. I've had like my, my website is shifter.media, which only came about about five years ago. Um, and it came about for reasons that blur, not for me personally. And then it morphed into a personal site. Um, and I call it a lifestyle site without the style. But the but prior to that, I had another site dating back to 2002. And what I love about my prior site, which was called Small Ranch and my site now called Shifter, there's no advertising. You know, I'm not blasting you with ads. I'm not, you're not subjected to an algorithm. There's nothing. It's just me. Every single thing on that site, from the interviews to the writing, to the photography, to the bike life, to the yoga, to Lyme disease information, that is all me. And it's, I control everything. And it's not this mountain of, of work behind the scenes. I basically post three, four, five days a week, and it's not a whole lot of effort. Um, and it's great. And I have this community of people from all over the world that I know through that site. But let me point out something else, um, and I think this is a good, um, this is sort of out of the, I would say, tradition of Craig Maud, although this was done way before by two totally different people. But I have a book called River of Traps, right? 
and this is sort of a legendary book in New Mexico. And this was done by two guys, um, William Dubois, who's a writer, and Alex Harris, who's a photographer. I've not met either of them. Uh, and this book sort of blew me away because if you can see, you'll see the amount of copy in the book compared yeah. to the amount of photographs. It is a huge part of, of this book is the copy. This is a, a documentary, an anthropological, long time, long, long form, like over a decade study of a small New Mexico mountain town and the, and the people who live there. And to me, that's the kind of project during COVID that is more applicable than the, you know, photo heavy, look at how great I am as a photographer, because it's almost impossible to do that kind of work now. So, you know, a guy like Bill DeBuies could be behind the scenes writing on a project like this all the time, making phone calls, going into the field by himself and studying and really making that that written content. So if you can get it, I think this book is still in print. It's actually a, a pretty remarkable uh, little piece of uh, documentary work. Okay. Awesome. Are we ready for point number four? Yeah, let's just answer this one question. What about direct mail? Hey, listen, uh, if you have the resources to send out a, an actual mailing, yes, do it. And, and as you said, you're zigging away while other people are zagging. If, you know, I don't know about your mailbox, but it's gotten pretty empty over the years. So when you get a real piece of something interesting, it, stand, it definitely stands out. So don't discount that. If you want to go for direct mail, so do it. I have been doing over the last two weeks, I've been sending out uh, my, you've, you've all heard me talk about this zine collaboration I'm doing with Beyond Clothing called AG23. There's, yeah. There were ten, nine contributors in the first issue. I sent all the contributors their, their stack of, of, ish, of copies for being in the first issue. They're arriving all over the world. I got an email from Singapore this morning. There's three going to uh, Australia. Can you guys still hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. I got a little poor connection button, which I haven't seen before. Anyway, I have been packaging these things up one at a time in a little cool box, a little like clamshell box that has black wrapping paper with a zine inside and a handwritten thank you note from me. And I am sending these to 100 people in my database. So 100 people that I have met over the last 30 years that I think are really important strategic people in the creative community. And I am sending one of these unannounced to all of these people because there is nothing like getting something in the mail, especially something exactly. that you don't know that's coming and you get it and you're just like, holy cow. Yeah. So if you want to zig towards direct mail, do it. Use it as a component of what you're doing. I wouldn't put all your eggs in that basket, but I would definitely do it. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back in time. 2007-ish. 2007-ish, Blurb comes out with something called a trade book. It's a format. It's a very small, informal little book like this that was never yeah. really intended for photography. However, I realized that if I prepped my files in the right way, that I could make a book that was very, very interesting. I love that. And I did. And, and this was $4, right? So I did this book. This book today is $2.00. 50 cents, I think. It's actually cheaper than it was back then. Now that's amazing. And so I did this book and, and I was like, okay, this is great. And the book did really well. It ended up at like, it was for sale at Photo Eye Bookstore. It was collected and written about all over the world. So it was a good book. But what I also did at the time, and this is the Moleskin Journal, is I also started a series of mixed media, ink on paper illustrations that were basically uh, inspired by the, the, the book itself. And so my fourth point is during COVID, if I don't have the ability to use my camera as much, one of the things I can do is, is go back to mixed media. And that could be ink on paper illustrations, which are, this is maniacal. This, to, this one took me like two weeks alone to do this one page. I'm not sure you can see the detail, but it just about ruined my eyesight. Um, you know, and I, I just continued to do a series of illustrations that were based on this plane book. And then ironically, I had people that saw these illustrations and said, can I buy those illustrations? Is there a, you know, a thing? The other thing I do is I use a lot of um, acrylic paints. This is a black and white acrylic that I use all the time. I think mixed media. And let me just say this. My artistic ability is almost zero. I have no ability to draw. I can't draw at all. And I have no training in paint, painting or art or art history or anything. I took one art history class in college because I had to and I hated it. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. So if I can do it, you can do it. And 
I think what it does is it forces me every time I do something with art materials or, or art supplies, I start out by being like crushed because I sit there just thinking, oh, God, I can't I don't know what I'm doing. But then you start putting it on. You just start making moves and all of a sudden things connect. You'll have little little victories, little successes. I think we might be hung up here. Are we totally hung up? No, I, we're good. OK, we're good. Yeah. So mixed media would be something I would highly recommend. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and you're really big into that. I know that you've talked about that. And like you were saying, uh, it's one of those skills that you just kind of have to develop because, you know, you've said that you've said this many times that when it comes to like drawing and a lot of art, it's not necessarily a natural ability of yours, but you just keep doing it. You do it. And that's the important thing. Yeah. And it's, it's put again, putting yourself out and, and start, start with your newsletter, your, not your newsletter, start with your, your journaling, because that's the easiest thing you can do every single day. Yeah. And also just the, the, those little trade books. Um, when I started, when I made the first plane one, I immediately started making every other those. project I was working on. So I did one on Morocco. I went to Morocco in uh, 2000. I did one on my man versus nature series, um, yeah. which was shot all over the world. And then I also did one on the uh, bloodless bullfighting in California Central Valley. This book's called Toro. Um, these were like, you know, four dollars a piece. And this this became my portfolio at the time is I just had stacks of these. And when I would if there was a client I wanted to work for, I would tailor whatever stories I thought would be most appealing to them. And I would fire these off in my direct mail at the time. I don't do that anymore because I don't work as a photographer. But if I was you and I was trying to work as a photographer, that would be on my list of approaches. OK, Dan, we have to earmark something. I want to do a yeah. show of. Uh, that walks people through and maybe this really needs to be a whole course walks people through the entire process of creating one of these zines with blurb i think that'd be really super valuable you guys agree how, how you know from soup from the start of the concept all the way through to the final product if you guys are interested that. in that let us know that's very cool now here you want to know the the the, the crazy part about this picture I'll give you 30 seconds to guess where that picture was made. And it's not in Spain or Mexico. Ooh, I was going to say Mexico. It was made it was made it was made in the United States in the most unlikely of locations you can possibly imagine. And I shot that with a Pentax 645, which was not easy. That is not a fast autofocus camera and um, I lucked out. That's one of my favorite pictures from the whole the whole event. That picture right. was made in the city of Los Angeles. That's Believe it or not, incredible. there is there is Portuguese bloodless bullfighting in the in the middle of Los Angeles. Believe it or not. Okay, no last idea. point is maybe the most important. So, I told you before that I had figured out this new story idea. I have a title for what it will be, which I'm not going to tell you because it would give it away. I have a title. I have the format that I am going to present the project when it is complete and it's not a blurb format it's actually a, 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 a resource called newspaper club which is based out of the uk i believe and they're a way you can print your own newspaper in short they do a lot of stuff i've used them before um and i got one of their emails recently and it reminded me i had not done something with their product in quite a while and that's what triggered me to go out on my bike and try to come up with a new project idea which I did. So I have a title and I have how it will be delivered when I'm done, but I can't photograph like I did before. So what I figured out I would do is that I will basically make little mini missions by myself and I will have to make a style of photograph that I have not made before, which is mostly images void of people. Like that to me is such a foreign concept to go photograph where there's no humans in my frame, but I have to. And there may be ways along uh, or maybe specific situations where I'm in public where there may be people in the frame. But I think it's the maybe that's 10 percent of what I end up shooting. And so the first thing I do is I may I put limits on myself to make it simple. So the entire project will be made with one camera, one lens. We've talked about this a million times before. Yeah. Um, this is, you know the latest version of my 50 millimeter, but it's a 50 millimeter lens. It doesn't matter what version you use. And just one camera, 
And then the secondary component will be my audio recorder. So this will be a mixed media story that will blend audio and stills and a lot of written copy. And the written copy will not be another repeat of history. It will be a very personal take on what it is I'm trying to do and say. And that's really, that's, that's the key here, is that this is a personal look at what these places represent. And this story has been done many, many, many times before. This is not something new. Um, but one of the things about working this way is I no longer have to get model releases. You know, if you're, if you're shooting documentary work, even if you're in a public place, you better get model releases these yeah. days because, and that is, that is just pains me to say that because it ruins everything about the scene. You, you cannot get model releases without ruining the scene. There's no possible way to do that. And the difference is, you know, documentary photographers historically have said, well, I don't need model releases because I'm in a public place. Well, those rules are all out the window now because we live in such a litigious society. It doesn't matter. And here's the, here's the crazy part. It, Having a model release will not stop you from getting sued or going to court. That is just a, the flat out reality of the world we live in. But it's a really good thing to have. Um, doing documentary work presents a very unique problem with that is because if you are a documentary photographer, the goal is to not really in, uh, interrupt the scenes in front of you. And I know this because I used to assist for a lot of really good documentary photographers. And one of my, my jobs during these assisting times where we would, we would walk into a scene, let's say the photographer and myself, I was the first assistant and the photographer is there and he's making photographs or she's making photographs. And we would get into the scene and not alter or change anything. There was an understanding that we were there. People would realize immediately that you photographers were there. And during that time, there really wasn't any big reaction. People would just acknowledge that you were there. And for the most part, you could just work. And then once the scene was exhausted, the photographer would tap me on the shoulder and start pointing at people in the scene and go release, 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 release. And then my job was to go in and get releases, explain who we were, what we were doing. That was a nightmare. Yeah, and sometimes it worked. And other, uh, that was horrible. And, it, and once once I entered the picture, the scene was blown up. It just, you yeah. know, everything was off and you had to move and go on. So the project that I'm shooting now, I don't need releases. I don't need permission. I don't need to interact with other people where I could potentially expose them to the virus. They could expose me, et cetera. It's not that important, right? We had to go back to the, the irrelevant scale. Um, viruses is the number one thing. And so I have to adapt and, and work in these spaces. But it's challenging to me to work in this new way where I'm sort of shooting photographs that I've never wanted to shoot before. And now I'm forced to do it. So I have the first couple of locations picked out of where I'm going to go. And these are these are re relatively small towns and I'll drive up in the van, I'll park, I'll get out with my audio recorder and my camera and I will just start working and I will piece together and I'll probably do this for a couple of months before I really, you know, even start to assess what I have. It's not it's not a project that I need need or want to rush. I would never like try to post things right away or or even explain what I'm doing to anyone until I'm, I'm further along. There's nothing worse than yapping about a project and then not being able to pull it off. And then you yeah. look like someone who just yaps. And I've done that before. And every time I did it, I just said, okay, I got to shut up until I actually have a project and then start talking about it. Don't be a yapper. So yeah. And I think what, what I'm, what I'm talking about doing, and this was a lesson I learned the hard way. I studied photojournalism, and photojournalism is all about rules. There's all kinds of rules, not, a, not, not only in addition to how you make the photographs, but how you have to look at photography and how you have to carry yourself. And, you know, you're part of a news gathering organization, and there's rule after rule after rule. But you also had this other side of photography called art photography or just photography in general that didn't associate with journalism. And art photography was like a hall pass. You could do anything. Yeah. And I, because I studied photojournalism, I had this myopic view of photography. And I looked at things like conceptual art photography. And I always said to myself, ah, that's not, I'm not interested in that. Or, or those photographers only do conceptual art because they don't know how to hack it as a journalist, right? Which in some cases is probably true. Reality-based photography is incredibly difficult and it's never gotten its fair shake in the art world. Art world doesn't even want to deal with it. You know, conceptual is what they want to, they spend most of their you know, time revolving around for the most part. Not always, but a lot. But I realized something. It took me about 25 years to figure this out. But conceptual art photography is really important. And for me, it is the last remaining 
piece of untouched wilderness left in the world. Journalism has been destroyed in a lot of ways, and you can see that every day. But art, conceptual art photography is wide open. You can do any conceivable thing. And the projects that I'm talking about doing now under COVID are far more conceptual than straight. And, I, and it took me a long time, and I fought with that forever to try to like come to grips with that. And now I'm totally fine with it. And a lot of the photographers and artists that I look at now, a lot of the photographers I'm most interested in are more conceptual art photographers than they are documentary people. Yeah. You know, the documentary thing is sort of an, an old shoe that's been worn many, many times. And I see a lot of retreads and a lot of the same things happening, but they're not even done as well as they were a few years ago. It's just sort of rushed. And conceptual art photography, I mean, I just saw I just saw another email from Hank Willis Thomas, who's a American conceptual art photographer who's just astoundingly good. Calling him a photographer is really sort of a limit. I would just say he's a conceptual artist who from time to time uses a camera. He's also a sculptor. He does experimental projects. And I was exposed to his work back at Look 3 Festival in Charlottesville about 10 years ago, and I just couldn't believe it. I, I didn't know who he was, and I felt embarrassed that I did not know who he was. And um, his name's Hank Willis Thomas. And I, I look at people like that, and I think to myself, that's who I want to learn from. Because he's at a level that I will never attain, but maybe if he's like dropping some crumbs along the way that I can learn from and go out and do something good. So I'm not, you know, yeah, I'm not wasting my time during COVID. Well, Dan, it's hard to believe we've gone almost 47 minutes. Let's do some questions. Yeah. Let's relate them to the five things that Dan brought up. What are they real quickly, Dan? Can you do our summary here? Point yeah, number one, who things, remembers back that far? The the number one is study. Yeah. Number two, number two is take your journal to the next level. Journaling. Number three is concentrate on writing strictly. Just write something for the sake of purely writing a written piece. Um, number four is don't forget to mix your, your media. Ink on paper, drawing, sketching, painting. And then number five was the mini mission of slimming down your equipment, choosing a destination and working on more of a conceptual piece than working on something that's going to involve a lot of human interaction. Okay, let's get some questions, Jared. I saw a bunch flying by earlier. Yeah, and... there's quite a few. There's one that I would actually really like to know um, what you have to say on this, Dan. Um, so we had a question from Timothy. Uh, when do you know how to stop researching? I fall into many rabbit holes because it's so fun to dig into a subject, but perhaps it can be procrastination sometimes. I know this is something that can affect me too when I'm working on a creative project and I do research and it's really easy to, you know, get stuck in the research and then not actually make anything. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Yeah, the rabbit hole. It's a good question. I often get the same question about books. How do I know when my book is done? Um, and I think that comes through practice and repetition. You're going to know. You can also look at the project itself and say, is the research that I find myself continuing to do, is it filling a hole in the story or am I filling something that's already full? So, and look, I there's my favorite thing in the world. I get up at five in the morning every day and I read for the first hour. I'm reading a book right now. I just started this morning about Churchill in World War II, and it's a it's a historical fiction book about Churchill having a conversation with his dead father that sort of influences his choosing of the war cabinet kind of thing. And so, you know, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, I don't know enough about Churchill. So, like, this is like an, it's the Pandora's box now of I'll be reading about Churchill for the next month. It, is that going to be helpful for me in, in any of my projects? I don't know. Maybe. But I would always err on the side of acquiring that knowledge, but only to the point where it's not distracting from the work itself. So again, yeah. I think having a, having a mentor, somebody that you can show the project to that says to you, look, you've got a hole here. You know, you're making a jump from photo A to photo B and you've got some copy, but I can't follow what you're trying to say. That's a hole. That means you got to go back and either do the research or make yeah. more photographs that sort of link. But once those holes are filled, move on. And once that that sort of you've uh, you know laid these photographs out. I think one trick that I do and a lot of other really good bookmakers do is as I'm doing a project, I'm making small prints, very small prints. And I am tiling those and laying out what I'm doing in real time. Yeah, that's and sometimes a really I, good idea. I, 
I know photographers who carry those prints with them and in downtimes are sequencing their work as they go. And th what they're doing is they're looking for holes. Does, do I need something I don't have? And, and again, practice and repetition. Another thing goes with that, Dan, is using post-it notes. When you're putting your, your work together, you can find a whiteboard or something. And then again, it's just like having those prints. You can see where the holes are. But visually getting, you know, I think the more we get these things out of our head or off the computer and do something visual, it's a lot easier to keep track of it. I can't imagine trying to edit a big project on the computer and like using the computer to sequence. Now, yeah, it doesn't work. Even even when I'm in like Blur Book Write and I use the Manage Pages tab, which is something I love. I've already printed those images prior to them coming into the software. I already know what I'm doing before I bring those in. Um, and I'm going to do a film here coming up about how I sort of play inside of software um, with no book in mind. I'll play inside to come up with strategies and design styles that I might use somewhere down the road. But most of the time, those little prints are very, very key uh, to understanding what I have. And the other thing about making those little prints is even though they're small and they're inexpensive, they force you to make decisions that you don't make on the computer. Yeah. And the com computer editing and sequencing can become incredibly sloppy because it's so hard to do. It's just a physiological it's it's difficult to be able to get your head around something when it's on a screen like that and so i see it i've seen it a long time that's why editing skill editing skills have really tapered off in the last decade because it's really hard even for really good editors to do that online yeah well dan i know you got a lot of lot to do well let, let's take one more question anybody out there and you know here's your shot You've got Dan Milner here. Fire away, guys. I love seeing you guys. There's a lot of engagement going on here, and we'll, we're going to go back and read these comments, too, if we miss people. Yeah, so um, so Ian wrote that there's a photographer named Louis Palu who talks tells about carrying around a little stack of prints that he's showing his other you know fellow photographers and getting help with editing and sequencing. The person that I saw that that I saw do that better than anyone I've ever seen is Todd Heido. And Todd Heido would start with these itty bitty prints and then they would slowly, you know, become stacks of like eight by tens. And that's what he would use to build his book dummies and his maquettes. And he would go through this incredible process of doing that. He was the one that I, I mean, I had been doing that forever, but Todd was at a whole different level and he's one of the best bookmakers you're ever going to find. And, um, if it works for him, it would surely work for a lot of us. Brilliant. Dan, anything else you want to say before we let you go? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I just That's uh, a lot of wisdom. Again, here, I, let's go. Let's go back to the beginning and talk about about patience and and us as a whole. Like yeah. every, this 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 phone call is filled. It's like the United Nations of YouTube lives. We have people from all over the world. We are now in a situation where all of us are intimately related through something that we never saw coming, and. We have to think about, I have to think about Mark. Mark has to think about Jared. Jared has to think about Ian, et cetera. This goes around the world where we all as a collective have to think about each other more than ourselves. And I think the adaptation thing more than anything else is applicable for today. Uh, I think we all are in the process of continual adaptation on a daily basis. And we just have to stay positive and stay smart and think about the collective and not about ourselves. I love it. Dan, once again, thanks for joining us. That's been fantastic. Boom, boom. I love it. We got a lot to talk about, a lot to think about, a lot to go over, and a lot to do. The thing to do, right, is translate everything we've gone over here, Dan's gone over, into your daily routine. And let's see if we can overcome any of those barriers that way. Thank right you, amigo. On. I will see you guys. I'll see you. I'll see everybody down the road. We'll see you soon. Adios, amigo. Adios. Se la vaya bien. Hasta. Guys, once again, AYP. We, I mean, look, I, don't you think we're kind of kicking butt here? I mean, really, let's just take take a moment for ourselves as part of this community to realize we're actually uh, moving the needle. And the more we can engage our uh, audience. Thank you, Dan. Well, there you go. The more we engage the audience, the bigger effect we have. Will you guys help me do that? It's really simple. Just tell your friends, get the word out. You know, you've got a lot of different ways of communicating to your friends, to your community, through whatever social media you're on. 
a newsletter. If you don't have a newsletter, you got your own email list. You've got just your mouth. You know, that works pretty well, too. Just telling people, let's expand this AYP community. So a couple of things on that note. If you are not a member of the AYP club, will you please jump in there? Jared, put the link up there because that's where this conversation continues and it's great to see the members of the AYP community in there talking to each other, giving each other advice, answering questions. In other words, you know what I would love is to have this broadcast going on 24 hours a day. We can't quite do that yet. So when we're not live, we can be on the AYP club. Join our newsletter, by the way, because that way you'll be up to date. Everything we do, we put out a newsletter for it once a week. Jared sends it out. Jared, put that link up that I put in there earlier, uh, how you can join the newsletter and be part of our own communication line with you guys. I did shoot this film last week. When was that? Sunday morning I got up. Saturday morning I got up and kind of just decided, well, I'm going to shoot this little film. It's always kind of interesting shooting your own film. I had one shot where I'm holding the camera and my little DJI, and that's kind of tricky. But it's about inspiration, how to be inspired. I'd love it. If you haven't seen it yet, please watch it right after this show. And I want to hear from you. One of the things I've been really, really digging is hearing your ways of being inspired. You know, this broadcast, what we do here with AYP, if you haven't already noticed, is a collaborative effort. I, it's not about what I think. It's about what I can bring you, you know, and connect you with guys like Dan Milner and Bob Holmes and Ed Kashi and all these other phenomenal people. But it's about you and it's your connection to this that makes so much difference it's you connecting with this community and your involvement. I think that's what really makes us very, very different. Have I left anything out? Okay, I want uh, to... I don't think you've left anything out, but I do have one thing I'd like to say quick. Um, so we had a lot of questions on finding projects and um, doing research that we couldn't quite get today. Yeah. Um, but... Dan has talked about those kinds of topics quite a bit, especially in um, several of our other live streams about projects. So I would encourage you, if you still have questions about finding projects, research, um, you know, along those lines, uh, go check out our Dan Milner playlist and any of those episodes that specifically say project, um, like long-term project or things like that. Um, those might have the answers that you're looking for. I know especially um, yeah. we did a live stream with him where he gave like five tips on projects. And if you go into the, the big live stream, he gives an example of if you were to do a project in ha uh, Haiti, yeah. what would you need to do? And so Jared, we, it, have, a, we would, have a playlist just for Dan. So you guys can binge yep. watch. If you haven't seen everything that Dan has done with us, Jared, put that playlist in here so that these we'll do guys and i'll have it. it in the description for those yeah who are also you guys should catch up with all your you know dan milner videos and you know just watch them all because you know listen we've been doing this i first my first uh shoot with dan was 2010 that's 10 years ago and we've been doing this for a long time so listen one last thing, you know, we just conducted this big survey and one of the biggest things that came up was how to be more creative. Interesting. Hmm. I wrote a book about that. And it, look, I spent a lot of time figuring out and finding from very creative people, 12 different very creative people, what worked for them, what barriers they had to overcome and how they overcame those barriers. And one of the other big items that came up in their survey is not having enough time. I wrote an entire chapter about how to overcome time because that's one of the biggest objections people have to living a creative life. What Dan has been talking about is, look, it's not just about being a photographer. It's about creating in all these different areas, being a writer, putting your design work together, putting your journal together. 
even how you live your life itself. And that's really what this book was about. So I just want to mention it to you. It just happens to be my own book, but it's pretty good. It works. And I'm not just saying that because I think it's good. I hear from you guys. So if you haven't checked it out, please do so. You know, shameless self-promotion, but it's a good book. And Jared, you can put the link in there if these guys haven't already gotten it. So listen, I could keep this going a long time. I love talking with you guys. It has become my most favorite form of communication with you because we get this live interaction. It's pretty friggin' amazing all around the world. Boom. Okay, well, I've pretty much said everything I need to say. Um, we're going to, who knows what's coming up next. I don't have anything planned for next week yet, but we'll get somebody amazing on with us. And I want to hear from you guys what you want to hear about. That's always helpful. You can put it in the chat here. You can put it in the AYP club. I love your suggestions and I love interacting with you. That's so important. Really, really important. Okay, well, listen, I'm going to wrap it up here. So if you haven't already done this, I want you to subscribe. <laughs> I want you to tell others to subscribe. I want you to enable the bell so that whenever one of our new shows comes up, you hear about it. And will you guys make sure you leave your comments and like it, share it with your friends. And there's one last thing, last but not least, and I want you guys to say this wherever you are around the world in your own language, okay? You know what it is? Remember to get out and capture your own images of life or write about your own images of life or write about your thoughts or journal or do any of these things we've been talking about. Okay, love you guys. Stay, stay, stay safe, stay well. We'll see you soon. Take care.